Okay, uh, let's share this again. So, uh, here's a question from Julie Cassidy. Hi, Julie. Uh, he's asked, uh, for more information about the people of the broch, please, what do we know about the individual whose jawbone was found? But also, do we know anything else about that local population? Okay, well, here's the thing about the RNH. In most parts of Britain, we have very few uh, human remains, really and very little that resembles a formal burial tradition as such, of the kind that you may be more familiar with from the Neolithic or the Bronze Age, for instance, or indeed from the early medieval period. In the Iron Age, human remains melt away into the background. We don't see so many uh, formal funerary situations. And what we do have, generally speaking, um, are uh, isolated, or disarticulated fragments of human bone found in certain contexts. And those contexts don't necessarily look like they're funerary or cemetery related. There are some exceptions to this rule. There are some sites like the wonderful Bersness or now of Ski site on Westry, in, again in Orkney, uh, where a large cemetery site was located. Um, but it's very unusual to get sites like that. Um, and more often we get these disarticulated human remains. And what Julie's alluding to here is, uh, is this thing, is this jawbone, this human jawbone that we found out in front of the broch. Many of you will know this story or the story of its context. It was found in a large whalebone vessel, more on that later, no doubt, uh, with two red deer antlers propped against the outside of it and a saddle quern, um, again, propped against the outside of the, the whalebone vessel, almost as if to press it against the outer wall of the broch. And we know that the date of this now, Julie, um, we know the radio, uh, the radio carbon dates are telling us that it was, uh, that the person died close to the time of the end of our broths, probably somewhere around about the mid second century AD. Um, as you can imagine, it's one mandible, it's one lower jaw, and therefore we can't build a massive case for the lifestyle uh, of this individual. But there is information that we can get from it and have already gleaned from it. Obviously, this poor soul, as you can see, uh, doesn't have fantastic dentition any longer. On this image here, there's only these two teeth shown. A third tooth was found as well that belongs to the same mandible, which slots in here. So in the lower jaw, there was almost just two, two, uh, sorry, three uh, teeth left in the jaw, and two of those of this hideous, horrendous dental carry on them. The, the, the one that's missing from this image also has this horrible hole in the tooth, which presumably was considerably painful at times in the life of this individual. We don't even know what, what whether this person's male or female, because from one jawbone alone, it's, it's fairly inconclusive. It's very difficult to look at the morphology, the form of a jawbone and see whether it's male or female. Now, just recently, uh, with the addition of two more experts, I can now say that we, we have surveyed five human remain specialists so far. They've looked at this job one. Let me get this right. Two of whom said it was uh, female, uh, sorry, male, and three of which have said they thought it was female. So it takes your choice uh, here. What, Ultimately, what will crack this, I think, I hope, is uh, DNA, and we, we anticipate doing DNA work on uh, that job, we to have a look at it, um, and, and get uh, the sex of the individual from that, but also, hopefully, lot, plenty of other information as well about, about the individual. Almost more interesting than, than that uh, is the fact that the jawbone, uh, when we sent off a radiocarbon dating, um, to cut a long story short, the radiocarbon lab also do certain, a certain amount of isotopic studies, carbon and nitrogen levels in the bone of the individual so that they can correct for the so-called marine reservoir effect when they do the radiocarbon testing. And because of that, they could see that this person has a fairly substantial marine dietary input into their bone. Now, 
this will probably come up again in some of the, the later questions. But one of the curious things about the Iron Age in Scotland, um, and indeed in most parts of Britain, is that for all we are an island uh, group, there are, generally speaking, in the small numbers of human remains that are recovered from the Iron Age, there's usually very little trace of marine diet in, input into the into the, the diet of the individuals. Which has always seemed a bit curious considering, especially somewhere like Orkney or any of the Northern Isles or any of the Scottish archipelagos, that, that, that people wouldn't turn to that resource, which generally speaking, we've got to presume that in the days before the advent of, you know, big fishing and industrial fishing, the seas must have been more or less teeming with fish. So this individual is one of the few who's from the middle Iron Age, middle and, and uh, Iron Age period, who's, who seems to have a fairly substantial marine input into the diet. So that's telling us something. What we need to do is do further studies to try and understand whether or not this person was consuming lots of um, fish or shellfish at one stage in their life, maybe towards the end of their life, especially with the um, with these, this dentition might have meant that it would have been um, useful for them to be uh, eating soft food or maybe only possible to eat soft food. The other possibility is that um, uh, the, the fish signature represents their diet throughout their life course. And that would be intriguing as well uh, to find out. So we wait and see and I'm afraid this is going to be a recurring theme in this uh, set of Q and A's. Is that there are more studies, more research, more work to be done for sure. There's more that we have to find out, um, and more that we assuredly will find out about the lives, the lifestyles of these individuals. And um, Julie also asked a question. Just pop back to it. anything else about the local population. Well, again, it's, on the one hand directly related to to the people of the site that's quite difficult we have a few other scraps of human remains of one kind or another largely loose teeth dotted around the site some of which may be deliberately deposited but but most of which are probably just lost in the course of people's existences and they've ended up in middens or dropped into floors etc um floors of buildings and the like um, but they will give us an opportunity to look at the, the life of people to some extent, and perhaps do more DNA work as well as isotope work to compare with the jawbone. And then, of course, we've got, and we'll probably touch on this again shortly, we've also got this quantity of human hair remarkably, miraculously preserved for us um, in the, the so called well underneath the broch, which we'll, again, we'll come back to that in another question, I think. So, we've got fleeting glimpses of fragments of human material if you want to call it that, from the site. Um, but nothing like a formal cemetery or a, a reasonably well-preserved population with which to try and reconstruct something of the, the lifestyle and the health and the physique of that community. However, everything that we excavate, of course, is telling us something about the local population because assuredly the site is itself a trap for information about the activities that that community were busily engaged in across the landscape, as well as within the buildings and the precinct of the site itself. So almost everything that we talk about uh, in this session and beyond in relation to the site and the findings from the site is telling us something about the local, local population. And if I were forced to characterise them in two or three words, I suppose I would say very busy, industrious, hardworking, probably goes for most prehistoric communities. Um, but also shot through with really fascinating social behaviour, lots of interesting practices related to depositing, well, things like the human jawbone and the whalebone vessel itself, but also animal burials that seem to have been formally placed across the site uh, and other caches or even hordes of material that have been deposited with a kind of an eye to expressive and um, reflective uh, kind of matters in their lives. So they're a busy, hardworking community, but they also have time to reflect and time to engage in 
uh, social lives and social practices, which for us as archaeologists is fascinating and a great combination. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Here's one from, here's a question from Andrew Wells, who asks, could Martin tell us a bit about the latest identified occupation of the site and any possible continuity of use into the modern period? That's a really interesting one, Andrew. It takes us well beyond the Iron Age, because we know that there's a, there's a, a Viking or Norse uh, phase, if you will, of occupation on the site as well. Um, but there's much later activity than that as well, not in the sense of a formal set settlement as such or occupation uh, literally on the spot, but there's certainly evidence of later activity. So if we skip to this picture of the geophysics, the area ringed here, of course, is the Cairns site itself with the, the Broch and the outworks and various uh, extramural complex radiating around it, but also the ditch system that runs around it, partly visible in this image as well. But one of the things you'll notice is, of course, these black stripes, and these are geophysical manifestations of ridge and furrow, post-medieval agriculture um, running across the site. And one of the reasons they're showing up so well in this geophysics, and this is a phenomenon that's seen quite a lot of um, geophysical surveys of, of prehistoric sites, is that the enhanced soils uh, the ameliorated uh, soils themselves uh, are highly magnetic in the geophysics and later subsequent agriculture brings this material up to the surface and shows it uh, very vibrantly. And that's this corduroy pattern, patterning that we're seeing across the site. So the site certainly was ploughed um, uh, in the post-medieval period. The site was... Um, uh, the, uh, the, the site itself, the trench itself that we excavated, that we've opened, also had some of these ridge and furrow beds evident in the uppermost crust of archaeology, if you will, on the site. So we excavated those and actually we've, we've actually archaeomagnetically dated um, some of those ridge and furrow beds as well. So we know uh, that one of them dates between 1690 and 1820 AD. So there's that evidence of agricultural activity on the site. Um, as well as that, other activities in the vicinity, uh, these things that you can see in the geophysics, so I'll just flick back and forward to indicate to you where I mean. So these blobs, of one kind or another, we think these are probably quarries. And again, they're probably post-medieval in date, although we have to be cautious in that because they could be a bit earlier. Um, so people have been quarrying in the vicinity and accessing stone um, in the vicinity. Um, and of course, the site itself, of course, is called the Cairns, and by which the local population presumably didn't mean uh, it, that in the archaeological sense of a Neolithic cairn, a Neolithic tomb. What they meant by that when they named the site, presumably, and this would have been itself a few hundred years ago, they meant this was a pile of stone and probably had quite a practical and pragmatic um, usage to it. It, it. it was used for stonework. Um, and in fact, an older name for the site, which is still appended to the Canmore, that's to say the Historic Environment Scotland's database of sites across Scotland, um, it was Cairns o the Boo. Now, Cairns o the Boo is represented in, in old maps um, uh, like this one, uh, grateful to the National Library of Scotland for grabbing this little screen grab here. This is just showing Winnet Bay, and the cairns uh, would be about here, so oh, a big part about here. And then, if you look at this, can you see this place name here, Bow? That is almost certainly another manifestation of Boo, which the cairns was once known by. But so long ago that no local, even a hundred years ago, when asked about this, the locals uh, in the vicinity apparently had no notion of the cairns being called the cairns of the boo. It's a much older term applied to it, recorded at some point in the distant past. Um, boo, of course, is a high status Viking place name uh, or a high status farmstead from 
the, the Norse and later period. What we don't know is whether the title Cairns or the Boo implies that the Cairns itself was seen as a Boo site, a high status farmstead site in the Viking or Norse period, or whether this is merely the Cairns of the Boo attached to the Boo, the Cairns that relate to the Boo. That's to say the Boo, the high status farmstead, was located somewhere else in the landscape. What I would say though is that that Boo place name, that Boo place name, there, uh, a little distance away from, from the Cairns, uh, just a few hundred metres to the north, in fact. That's, that could be um, a survival of the earlier, uh, the Boo location itself. So it may be that by the time you're getting into the uh, 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, uh, that, that uh, the Cairns itself was, was not somewhere that was a, a paramount location for uh, occupancy itself but but an adjunct to the the, the greater estate there um the the latest occupation the latest activity on the site uh, ourselves you might say in excavating the site we've uncovered earlier excavations and we know that in 1901 the Reverend Goodfellow, Alexander Goodfellow was digging on site. He first discovered the site if you will which actually is not quite true because of the year before he was digging there the son of the actual landowner there had uh, was excavating the site. We don't know what what drew him there to excavate that site but a group of locals were, were with him um, excavating the site there in the very early 20th century. Um, uh, and we know that there's a Viking presence or Norse, a high medieval presence on site. We've got rid of carbon dates for things like a corn drying kiln on site, uh, which dates to the uh, 12th or 13th century AD. So there's, there's occupation there running through, um, certainly from the Iron Age through into the Viking Norse uh, and into the, the medieval. Then we think there's probably a break uh, it's no longer occupied after a certain point in time. In fact, even the Norse activity on site looks quite light and ephemeral. So it may be that even by then, the Cairns was a site that was occupied, um, but uh, not not really the, the paramount location in, in the Viking estate around uh, Winnick, if you will. Whew, okay. <coughs> Uh, so from Luke Williams, got a whole host of questions here. Um, a, a lot of it, well, starting off on whale bones. So Luke says, what other sites have shown whale bones and do they show any anything similar to this site in any way? Well, yes, uh, short answer would be uh, almost every site in every prehistoric and early historic site that's excavated in Orkney, um, where, where the, where the uh, soil conditions are good, and promote the preservation of, of decent amounts of bone, then you do tend to find whale bone present um, frequently on sites. Uh, so it is quite prolific. It is quite a, there's quite a lot of that material around. Um, uh, the cairns, we've got quite an astonishing volume of it for that site, but then we have been excavating the site for quite some pe considerable period of time. Uh, and it may be that there's more of that material at the Cairns because of relative status uh, with it and other sites in the vicinity. But most sites do, most sites in the Northern Isles tend to, to reveal whalebone. Um, so there's quite a lot of it around. Um, <clears throat> and then Luke's second question on that, have other whalebones been given DNA testing? Could the animal parts have been traded or taken somewhere? Well, the, one of the things about it, that, that that's a, a reference to the DNA work, the genetic work that we've been doing recently collaborating with colleagues, um, uh, Vicky Sabo and uh, Brenna Frazier. And uh, the, the the DNA has shown some really amazing stuff that we've been getting from it. Um, but DNA applied to whalebone is relatively in its infancy. There's been a few other pieces of work that's been done and it's all really, really interesting stuff. And one of the things that we, we wondered is, could we maybe at some point pick up traces of 
the, if we could narrow things down to a sing, if the, se several bones to a single individual, could you even possibly, at some point, see whale bone moving around a number of sites, you know, one individual strewn across or separated, a, a carcass cut up, separated, and moved across a number of sites. Um, so far, the amount of work that we've done wouldn't be able to support that. And we've looked at the cairns and in, in this same collaboration uh, with Vicky and Drenna, we've looked at uh, the site of Minehow, which uh, is at least in part contemporary with the cairns. Minehow, another site in, in Orkney in East Mainland. Um, but the volume of whalebone that was studied for this collaboration at this stage from Minehow, only really a handful of bones, so probably not enough. But certainly my colleague Ingrid Mainland uh, in the Archaeology Institute uh, of UHI here and based here in Orkney, um, I've had a number of conversations with Ingrid, with Ingrid along the lines of, could we at some point possibly get to a stage where we could see the movement of individual whale carcasses across sites. That would be really exciting. For one thing, it would be fascinating in terms of the kind of socio-economics of Iron Age society and how these these windfalls, if you will, or tidefalls, probably a better, more appropriate term, of a great whale perhaps beaching and how it might be separated amongst the a number of different communities. It might actually give you some kind of inkling of the relative standing and status uh, of these communities. Um, the other thing that would be wonderful about it would be it would, it would narrow down uh, dating of sites. Uh, radiocarbon dating is is astonishingly powerful tool for dating sites, but it's still the case that the standard deviations, the, the statistical margins that we're dealing with when we get radiocarbon date back, mean that it can be quite difficult, almost impossible, in fact, to prove uh, that one phase of a site was actually contemporary, absolutely, with another phase from another site. So identifying materials that effectively refit uh, strewn across a number of different sites would be a very powerful tool for dating intragenerational uh, 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 chronologies and temporality. So it would be astonishing from that point of view. But thus far, we've not managed to do that. Nobody's managed to do that at this stage, but it would be really interesting to, to, to follow that up. And then the third question that Luke had was, what was a typical diet for these people? I assume if you're not used to eating whale, it would have some sort of bad effect initially. <laughs> How long does whale meat keep for? Um, okay, well, the typical diet for people in the Iron Age was much was very broad and diverse compared to, um, you know, they're certainly not sitting around waiting for whales to beach and then uh, munching that up greedily and, and then starving for ages. These people are from the Iron Age, they have a very successful mixed economy, if you will, a mixed farming economy of arable and pastoral inputs. So they're growing lots of crops, mainly barley. Um, they're growing that bit quite effectively. And they're also keeping a number of animals, the classic um, triptych, if you will, of uh, domestic animals from this country, uh, cattle, sheep and pig. But they're also um, accessing lots of red deer. We've had lots and lots of red deer bone and antler from the cairns and <clears throat> a number of other animals as well. Lots of different animals represented in the in the animal bone assemblage from site. But the, the typical, the main uh, diet, the main staples uh, in the meat side of things are cattle, sheep and pig uh, and barley is growing in abundance and they're probably uh, well, in fact, there's no probably about it. We know for a fact that they are dairying as well. Uh, certainly, uh, they're obtaining milk, uh, and it's very strong likelihood that they're they're making that into butter and cheeses and other sorts of you know nice, rich, high fat um, foodstuffs that are good for these northern so-called hyper Atlantic climates that we have in uh, the far north of Scotland. So that that's typical diet. Um, the other part to your question, uh, if you're not used to eating whale, would it have some sort of bad effect initially? Uh, maybe, maybe if you're not eating vast quantities of it, perhaps. So like anything, if you're stuffing yourself full of any kind of quantity of food, then yeah, it'd be problematic. The, we've got to imagine that in the days before the advent of industrial whaling, that there were considerably larger numbers of whales out there in the ocean, and that inevitably that might mean that there were 
more strandings than even today. And then on top of that, one of the, one of the big mysteries or big questions is whether sometimes they were uh, assisting that stranding by um, cutting off bays, um, scaring animals inshore uh, in little boats, that kind of thing, or uh, maybe even actively hunting some of the whale species, not all of them, but maybe some of them. Um, sounds quite uh, terrifying. I'm sure it would have been. <laughs> um, but but that's a question that we can't yet answer, um, but is one that is a really important and interesting one as well, where people were actually hunting the whale. We don't know that as yet, but we, what, we, what we can say is that because of the likely larger number of whales that were out there in the ocean, it probably meant that people were eating whale, if not often, then at least regularly. Um, and their guts were no strangers to that food stuff, perhaps. Um, and could you keep it uh, over time? Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. You could you could air dry it, I guess, uh, and you could do all sorts of other interesting cultural uh, culinary practices uh, with the whale bone, um, uh, with uh, whale meat, rather, I should say. Um, I suppose you could smoke it. You can certainly salt it and uh, and preserve it in that fashion. Um, but certainly smoking, and you can imagine elevated into the rafters above hearths and the like and gently smoking away, or, or maybe a purpose-built smoker, you never know, but certainly you could preserve some of the meat. But yes, I think the volume of meat that's available from a really big whale would have to be dealt with, I think, in fairly short order. You would have to find a way of distributing that relatively quickly so as not to waste it. If, if that was deemed to be an issue. Um, and then look has another question, number four, if, if 19 out of 33 bones are from one whale, what about the others? And that's that's a direct reference to the, the publicised uh, genetics uh, project that we've been involved in, that I've been mentioning, where but actually 20 bones were from thin whale, but, but a, a couple of the bones can't be proven to be from one individual. Um, so Luke's asking what about the others? Uh, well, here's, whoops, here's the, here's the layout of those genetically tested whale bones from site. So you've got a number of different species. There's fin whale, but there's also humpback whale, uh, sperm whale, grey whale, North Atlantic right whale, and minke whale. And then we also had a number of, um, bone samples that, that failed the test that could uh, genetically or molecularly discern what species they came from. So you can see there's lots of the fin whale spread across the contexts, um, but there's also humpback, sperm whale, grey, North Atlantic right whale and minke whale. The thing about all those species of whale um, is they're quite large, they're quite big whales. Um, we're not talking about dolphins and porpoises and, and the like. We're talking about relatively substantial animals. So one argument could be that a site like the Cairns, if we're to see it as a, a sort of representing high social status, if the Brock itself is an important place, if important people are associated with it, if the community itself is deemed to be an important community, then perhaps the differential access to types of materials of one kind or another, including certain sorts of foodstuffs, even uh, wild foods, foodstuffs or access to things that come up onto the beaches, all sorts of materials like driftwood, but also whale uh, carcasses. Um, it perhaps a, an elevate, a community with elevated social status has some kind of social or political uh, claim on this kind of material more than some other communities. And maybe this, the presence of large whale bone species uh, at the Cairns, maybe that's an indication, but we've got more work to do. And, <clears throat> and in fact, it won't just be from one site that we've gained this impression. We'll be, we really have to compare this with other sites to get a, a stronger sense of, of whether that could be the case or not. But, it, but these are interesting whale species. And it's terribly trapped tragic and sad as well, because species like fin whale, uh, the one that we've probably made more 
uh, more of a deal out of in terms of the publicity of this genetic study. Fin whales vanishingly rare on this side of the Atlantic now, really, you don't see much of them. Uh, but even worse is the plight of the North Atlantic right whale. Deeply sad. Um, the very few of these around on this side of the Atlantic at all today that hasn't been a spotting, I think, of a North Atlantic right whale for a considerable period of time on this eastern side of the Atlantic. Um, <clears throat> so that's very sad, but also what it means is it's very, very interesting for uh, geneticists and conservationists uh, who are interested in the plight of these animals and who are interested in bolstering the numbers or understanding why the numbers have not bounced back since the moratorium on whaling. Um, whereas some of the species have made a, a recovery uh, since uh, hunting stopped, species like the North Atlantic right, right whale still not doing very well in the world. So this is, it'd be lovely to think that in our own small way that a study like this from the Cairns might give might contribute to the overall data set of information about numbers that existed in the ancient past uh, and and through into the into the uh, uh, conservation issues that go with that in the present. <coughs> uh, and then number five, the final one from Luke, he asks, the bones left on the broch that's believed to indicate closure aren't just whale, what do you believe is the significance of the other animals? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, you're right, Luke, there's lots and lots of other animals, sometimes what we call animal bone groups from the site, uh, EBGs, uh, to give them their acronym, <coughs> or associated bone groups, as they're sometimes known. Uh, and these EBGs are found quite commonly across uh, the site, in fact. Um, and they are, some of them are juvenile cattle, there's sheep, there's pig, there are carcasses. <clears throat> they're in they're in contexts or situations that are out with the the more obvious midden locations. That's to say the, the rubbish piles or trash piles that we find in other in various parts of the site, um, where you more or less have more disarticulated um or at least or just a loosely articulated bone. In the case of these ABGs, these other animal bone groups, um, the, these are parts of or whole carcasses that are properly anatomically um uh articulated and and whole or partially articulated as i say and these look like they've been laid out deliberately um with uh, the intention of perhaps offering carcasses to who knows what it, what what esoteric or supernatural or um uh religious uh beings entities or beliefs these people had um, and it, it does look like they're laying out these carcasses in a like, semi-formalised kind of manner um, to do with closure. So, for instance, on the lid of our well, the stone slab that was used to seal the entry down into the underground staircase, there was a, one of these animal bone grips was laid out on that on that stone before uh, the, the broth was infilled at the end. Um, and similarly, we've found other animal bone groups from later periods, but all of them always in moments of transition on site. So it looks like it was a practice or a tradition that people followed over a considerable period of time to do with acts of closure or foundation, for that matter, foundation of uh, subsequent um, phases or buildings or structures or features on site. So. It's quite fascinating, these animal bone groups. And one of the other interesting things is that, that uh, the more we look for them, the more we find, as is often the case in archaeology. Um, so we've now up to about 23, 24 of those animal bone groups. And so far, almost all of them are coming out of these, what we call these transitional uh, stages between what we identify as one phase of the site and another phase of the site. 